Hello, and welcome to Mindful Entrepreneurs Thriving at emmythriving.com. We're your hosts, the Jimenez siblings, Vivi, Tati, and Jerry. Join us as we support you to thrive using mindful strategies, online marketing, and a growth mindset. We'll also interview inspiring leaders in different fields to explore how they've achieved results and fulfillment. Let's get started as soul, innovation, and business come together at Mindful Entrepreneurs Thriving. Dr. Manuel Elkin Patarroyo is a world-renowned Colombian scientist and humanitarian. He developed the first chemically synthesized vaccine against malaria and donated the patent to the World Health Organization in 1995 to ensure a cheap and accessible cure for people in developing countries. Since then, he's been committed to developing a 100% effective synthetic malaria vaccine. His leading research and achievements have opened up the door to developing chemically synthesized vaccines for all infectious diseases. He conducted postdoctoral studies at Yale and holds a PhD from Rockefeller University in the U.S. and also specialized in tumor immunology at Karolinska Institutet in Sweden. He received his MD from the Universidad Nacional de Colombia, where he is a full professor of molecular pathology. Dr. Patarroyo has been awarded over 50 prestigious awards, including the Prince of Asturias Award in Spain, the Robert Cook Prize in Germany, and the Leon Bernard Prize from the World Health Organization. He holds more than 28 honorary doctorate degrees from universities around the world. He is currently the director of Fundación Instituto de Inmunología de Colombia, which is certified by the World Health Organization as a world reference laboratory. Welcome back, everyone, and thank you for being part of the Mindful Entrepreneurs Thriving Family. Today, we'll be speaking with one of the world's top experts in vaccines and infectious diseases. We'll talk about his groundbreaking innovations, the novel coronavirus, and how to thrive through challenging times. We're honored to have Dr. Manuel Elkin Patarroyo joining us, because at times like this, we need to have somebody we can trust. Dr. Patarroyo is not only a leading edge scientist and brilliant medical doctor, but he's also a humanitarian who has helped change the world. And for that, we are honored and grateful that you're here with us. Welcome, Dr. Patarroyo. I also would like to add Dr. Manuel Patarroyo. Uh, we met back when we lived in Colombia and our families know one another in part th thanks to his daughter, Maria Cristina, who is a dear friend and accomplished medical doctor as well, and just a beautiful and kind heart. So Dr. Patarroyo, welcome. Thank you for an amazing family and thank you for all you've done for all of us. And thank you for being here. This is not male chauvinist, but let me start with the eldest one, who is Gerardo. You know, mm -hmm. so thank you very much indeed, Gerardo. You. And the youngest one who is Viviana, and you are in the middle, Tatiana. So yeah, you <laughs> were caught like, um, like a sandwich, roughly. So <laughs> thank you very much indeed by this wonderful, fantastic invitation. You have been very generous with your words of introduction. So I am very happy and very proud of that. And as Tatiana said before, the relationship started a long time ago because she was the classmate at the school with my daughter, the only one I have. I have two more children, two, they are men, and um, they were very close friends. So that I used to, how will I say, stand Tatiana, my daughter, at home. So that, <laughs> that's the reason she was the connection. Thank you very much indeed for insisting, Tatiana. Oh. Thank you very much indeed, Gerardo, Viviana. And I would like very much to express my gratitude to the engineer Edwin Ramirez, who has been the person who has been making all the connections. I am not, how will I say, an expert on this, uh, because I spend most of my time designing and developing molecules for vaccines. So for that reason, I appreciate very much the help from other people in the different disciplines. Thank you very much to all of you. Thanks a lot. It was wonderful, and I'm very happy to be with you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. It really means a lot to us as well. It, it is our pleasure. So we'd like to start out by giving our viewers uh, a chance to get to know the person behind all the scientific success. And to give our listeners a glimpse of the caliber of our guest, we love to highlight just one of the recent acknowledgments. There was a book published in Europe uh, titled Top 40 Plus One Innovators Who Have Changed Our World in the 21st Century. Now, the book highlighted experts such as Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, 
Jane Goodall, and Nobel Prize winners. And in the field of medicine, our very own Dr. Manuel Elkin Patarroyo. Thank you very much, Gerardo. You know, it was, how will I say, one of the most unexpected recognitions. Uh, because all of you know that, mainly Tatiana and obviously all your family, I have never been interested in other things. Nothing, nothing but to develop solutions for humankind, working in health, you know, and since uh, for reasons that we will analyze later on, I decided to work with vaccines. So for that reason, it was for me absolutely unexpected. I never expected it to be, all I see, included in that group of 40 giants. And I said, what well, I am doing it here, you know? <laughs> well, anyhow, I cannot go there and ask them for money because if you do that, then they consider that you are not feeling the bear. So <laughs> that's the reason. <laughs> leads us to our first question for you, Dr. Patarroyo, because being among such amazing company that of innovators that have changed the world, you actually decided to donate your vaccine, your innovation. And this vaccine is the first synthetic vaccine developed for malaria um, in the world. So why give away basically your life's work up to that point, your, your innovation to the world, when you could have probably sold it and made a good profit. Tatiana, do you really think that it is worth to, how will I say, to minimize that achievement? Uh -huh. Putting a price for it. $120 million was the offer. It was about 35 years ago, 35 yeah. years. Could you imagine how much could it be right now? Well, but I always said to myself what I want to do, and it has been in my family too. We are 11 children, and I am the eldest, like Gerardo, you know. And then uh, we were taught by our parents that there is nothing better than to work for humankind. That was introduced by them. Two people who were from a very little village, no more than 5,000 people, but they had a very, very universal, bright, broad ideas well, what humans should be. And that it is something that we are seeing right now. We are needing that kind of solidarity. They never call it generosity, but they call it solidarity. It is to be solidarious with the complete human beings, with all the humankind, with all the people. As I always tell the people, I don't care if you are black, if you are white, if you are green, if you are square, if you are round, if you are whatever, you are a human. And so for that reason, I never, never was interested in gaining one single penny, and that we will do with the new vaccines that we are in the process of developing. You will hear about that very soon. And you can call me right away once I make the announcements, and I will respond to all of you. Uh, just I'm warning you that it's going to be very soon, let's say in less than a year. And uh, in essence, it's going to be the same. We are going to donate the patents to humankind, to all, to everybody. So everybody can produce them according to our rules, because I don't want the people making mistakes and then, and then later on blaming us on the mistakes that they may know. These have very precise chemical and physical rules that have to be followed to obtain the results that we obtain. And that was something that happened with the first vaccine. When they produce it in the United States, it was not as well developed as it was ours, but they use it. And from then, from then, the people has been thinking that that vaccine failed, which is not true. You know what is happening was that it was not properly synthesized. It was not properly according to the physical chemical and rules that we have defined. So for that reason, everybody, and I want to share with you, Gerardo, Bibi, and Tati, I want to share with you that you can tell the whole world, you know, that for whatever we do here in our institute, we will go to humankind for free, free. We care very much about their health. That it is what it is relevant and important for all of us. 
Thank you so much. And we will definitely, we would love to have you back to share with the world uh, that amazing accomplishment. We can't wait for that. And also, Dr. Patel, you, you hey, hey, be careful. It's a deal. It's a deal. deal. It's a deal. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. It's an honor. And Dr. Patarroyo, if you could explain to uh, our audience, because we may not be as familiar as you, of course, uh, uh, the difference between uh, a biological vaccine and a chemical or synthetic vaccine. Like, what are the benefits of having developed that? Tati and friends, well, Gerardo, Vivi, and obviously, but the friends that, were, that are listening to us, you know, the difference is absolutely striking, you know, huge. Uh, the biological vaccines, the ones that we are using up to date, you know, are based on the principles established by my hero. One of my heroes, I have two. My father is one, and the other one is Lou Pasteur, you know, Luis Pasteur, you know, the one who developed the first vaccine, the rabies vaccine. And, you know, it is that what he did by then is 1880, 1880, almost 140 years ago, you know, that what he did, it was that he took the microbe that caused the disease. And by then, the only ways to do a physical destruction it was the microbe heated, heated. In such a way, all the proteins and materials of the microbe that was causing the disease was practically involved in there, but dead, absolutely dead. Nowadays, the people do it in a different manner. Let's call those ones dead vaccines. They can be irradiated. They can be also used with chemical compounds that inhibit the DNA reproduction and so on. So that's one way for biological vaccines, to produce biological vaccines killing them so that they are dead vaccines. The other way it is by another principle introduced by Pasteur, that you can mutate the agent through a lot of different steps, you know? And for that reason, he thought that he had mutated. But it turns out that what happened was that with all of these different steps, of growing and production on, you know, what he was selecting, strains that exist in nature that are able to induce defenses, but not the disease. Uh, did I make my point clear? So that these are the difference. One of them, it is the dead, and the other ones are the attenuated live vaccines. So that that's the second methodology in biological epidemiology. The third one was after the DNA revolution, where you can clone specific molecules from that microbe into bacteria that grow very fast, like the E. coli, and to obtain that product in large amounts to be used as vaccines. Chemically synthesized vaccines are totally different. That was a concept that I was mentioning to you before and to Gerardo and to Bibi. I had the very, very big luck at name years old to be received at Rockefeller University. In the United States, everybody knows what it is Rockefeller University. It is the cream of the cream, but it has only chemistry and biology. That's all what it has. It has no law, it has no, how will I say, philosophy, it has no the other humanitarian disciplines. Well, it turned out that I had the good luck to be trained by someone who's a student and he himself got the Nobel Prize in medicine. And I was with that person since I was 19 years old. Then later on, just across the hall, there was another guy, very bright, you know, who was doing the chemical synthesis of those molecules that the previous one had defined already. His names are Henry Kunkel, Henry Kunkel from Rockefeller University, and Bruce Merrifield, the Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, from Rockefeller University by 1984. So that what it happened it was that for me it was relatively simple to jump from one room to the next just across the hall and to understand that vaccines could be chemically synthesized. But when I asked them, do you really think that chemically synthesized vaccines are feasible? They said, yes, they are absolutely logical, very, very feasible, but it will take you 
a lot of time and I respond the way I am. I don't care, it's my life and I have the right to spoil it the way I want, which is why I've been doing it. You know, that was the reason. And so, as you can see, this is the difference. You understand and you isolate and you identify the relevant molecules or the mo microbes, determine the chemical structure and then synthesize them later on. And so the benefit for humans, like for us about to have a, a chemically synthesized vaccine is that they're more stable and they're not dead, correct? Absolutely, absolutely, Tati. And not only that, they are absolutely pure because nowadays the chemistry has advanced so much that you say, well, this is the fragment of the protein that it is relevant for the microbe to infect. You just determine how it is made and then you synthesize it according to that chemical analysis and you produce it absolutely pure so that there are no secondary effects, consequence of the contaminants. And uh, well, it has, it takes a, whole of, a hell of a lot of life. Let me tell you that I have been working on this for the last 40 years, but we made it. We made it. You can count on that. Awesome. That's awesome. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Very clear. And thank you for putting it in layman's terms so the rest of us can understand the, the difference. Now, one question I have is, what do you think uh, about the whole anti-vaccine movement that's been so popular nowadays? I would like very much to ask them, wh how do they feel now? Yes. And everybody is claiming for a vaccine, you know, and the numbers of deaths. What about an anti? an anti-vaccine movement now. I would like very much to challenge them to see what do they think about that. You know, A lot of people make... don't want to be vaccinated here in the United States. They say it's, it's very, very bad for you. I would like very much to ask if among the 100,000 people that have been already infected and the number of deaths, that are almost a million or perhaps a little bit more than a million people infected, how many of them are anti-vaccine? You know, because it's the only solution nowadays. So now, now you know, we're, we're living right now in unprecedented times, as, as we all know. And we all have a lot of different questions, specifically about this novel coronavirus. Um, so if I'd like to ask you a question moving more towards that. And, you know, some say that social distancing measures are going to have to be in place until we do have an effective vaccine. Um, what are your thoughts? And if this is the case, what, do you, uh, what can you tell us about the possible development of the vaccine in the coming months? You're absolutely right. And I agree completely with the, how will I say, governmental movements in the sense that we don't have so far, so far, any other way <clears throat> to control the spread of the disease, you know? Uh, in a sense, where we are is returning to our original beginnings, you know? For example, when the tribes were sort of small, they were moving towards the jungle, exposed to different new microbes, and well, the people died, but they were very few. The other ones were isolated and so on. So we are, how they say, moving backwards in that sense until the vaccines are developed. Mm -hmm. yes, you're right, absolutely right. Yes, and, and, and what do you think or what can you tell us about the development of a potential vaccine in the coming months? In the coming months, uh, let me tell you that there are many, 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 many people mm -hmm. nowadays, but my recommendation it will be, probably I am making a big mistake right now, because we want to reserve that field for us and we have to move very fast, which it is rather than using biologicals, try to produce it chemically. Because not only you have to recognize the specific fragments, let put me this example, very simple since you introduced the question. You know, the coronaviruses are called corona because they have a special protein, which is called spike. I spike from molecule to be able to function and to bind to the cells that they are going to fire. Have to make a trimer, meaning in other words, three molecules have to be together 
in order to bind to the receptor. That's what is going to happen. You know, if you synthesize the whole complete molecule, which is a huge molecule, first of all, from the molecular biology point of view, it's going to be very difficult. But in chemistry, you have to make it in small pieces. 20 amino acids long, no more. 20 letters, rather than having a molecule that has 1,200 letters. Could you imagine that? The difficulty that's going to be. But unfortunately, the whole world is moving toward that, because that was the solution that it was originally presented by the people. I completely disagree with that. Let me say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let's hope that someone, I don't want to say who, will tackle the problem from the chemical point of view. Mm -hmm. There has also been some discussion or extensive discussion regarding uh, the appropriate measures that we should be taking during this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I guess we've heard that an effective measure is to test the broad part of the population and then isolate those who come back as positive for COVID-19. Uh, but it seems that this has also evolved over time. From your point of view, what do you think is the most efficient way at the moment to contain the pandemic? That's a pity, you know, I have to say that a long time ago, I said that for this kind of new infectious diseases, because they are new for us, for the human, but not for the animals, for the reservoirs, you know, they are natural in them, you know, they don't cause any problems. Let me tell you what do I know about that. When I started my scientific life, I was in the second year of my medical studies, and I started my scientific life with someone who was an outstanding personality. He was a physician, graduated from Yale University, who has also a doctoral degree in viruses. And he was the one who discovered the Ebola-like virus in South America. You know, the name of the virus is Bolivian hemorrhagic fever virus. And this Superman, who was a Superman by then, because that was discovered by him by 1962, that means 50 years ago, roughly. You know, he went to San Joaquin in Bolivia and identified the virus, which was, that belongs to the family of the Ebola virus, and he was able to do that. I started my life, my scientific life, I was 20 years old, you know, when I started that. So I know a little bit about that. You know, it was because the people were moving towards the area where there was a special mice called orisomis, you know, where this virus didn't cause any diseases, you know. It reproduced normally in the bladder or in the, how would I say, in the kidneys of these mice, but they didn't hurt them. But since the mice urinate and also eat most of the times from the crops, you know, obviously the people who were, uh, how would I say, keeping all of this in small areas independently, you know, used to eat that contaminated with the urine and also with some, some feces of those, of those, uh, those mice. In the human, it is absolutely lethal. It is worse than the coronavirus because the killing efficiency of that, the lethality, was 50%. But this man identified the virus. He almost died, but he got a transfusion from one person who had previously recovered, and finally he recovered. He came to Colombia, and he was my first mentor. His name is, don't forget it, because the people has the tendency to forget, you know? His name is Ronald Mackenzie, you know? So in essence, what it happens it is that we are moving towards, you know, those areas where these viruses are absolutely normal in their normal host, yeah, like in this case. And we are exposed in huge amounts, in huge numbers of people. So for me, really, the answer is, let's go to, stay at home while someone develops a vaccine, you know, that allowed us to work perfectly.
Unfortunately, the people didn't listen to me by then, unfortunately, I have to say that with a lot of pain. The way to do it is to put in quarantine the people who is sick, yeah, who has developed or is developing the disease. But to put in quarantine also all the normal contacts, his wife, his children, his family, they, if they had mates, the mates and the relatives and friends who come to visit him. Put them on quarantine, 10 people. And put on quarantine also 10 people contacting those 10. Meaning, in other words, that for each infected person, you had to put in quarantine roughly 99 more. That it is the answer. You know, you have to control first the infected person, then the one that by sure are going to be contaminated, which are the first ring of contacts. And by sure, some of them, any one of them, will be able to contaminate a second ring of contacts. That it is much more logical and that's much more simple than locking completely a country. Yeah, but for that, we would have have had to test it a broad number of people to begin with. Absolutely, absolutely, you know. And also, nowadays, thanks to the development of technology by, how will I say, by, by, by computer or how will I say, by mobiles, you can know exactly what it is that each person is now. You know, so that it will be the solution, definitely. Unfortunately, the people didn't listen. And well, what can we do? Yeah, thank well, you. Let's wait for the vaccine. Makes sense that one ten ten, so you can actually end up isolating the whole hundred people. Completely at the beginning, you know, it's very simple. Yeah. Gerardo, it's extremely simple. As soon as you start detecting the disease, which it was very logical and very simple nowadays because one has to recognize that the Chinese, I, we don't know how long did it take to them, but they announced it, that they had already identified the new agent. And also they gave the amino acid, pardon, not the amino acid, but the genomic, that's the RNA sequence of the virus, you know? So that the methods to make the diagnosis from the molecular biology point of view, you know, these diagnostics, that we can use right now with PCR, you know, that were practically immediately developed, you know, so that we could have had the control of lots of, how would I say, let's say that by then 10,000 people, multiply that, it will have been the control of roughly 1 million people, which never happened. Yeah. It never happened, you know, so that that's my, how would I say, hurt. It hurt me. Thank you for sharing that. Now we have some questions from our audience and Reynaldo from Chile asked the following questions. There has been some talk that the novel coronavirus was created by then. What are your thoughts on that? Well, that's uh, how I say, I don't know which are the purposes behind those ideas, but it is very difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, this virus to work with that one, it is so difficult. Uh, myself, I am also, uh, a chemist and molecular biologist, both. You know, if you want to make a, a, a mutation into any one of these viruses or any one, because nowadays there is a family of this SARS-CoV-2, you know, um, if you want to make a mutation on them, it will, it will be a pain in the neck. <laughs> How can you do that if you have to introduce a very large stretch of mutations in order to convert it into highly, come on, that's a very good question from this Chilean a friend, but you know, it's a lot of fantasy. We have another question from Wendy from Australia, and I think you touched on this a little bit, but it's worth asking. Are there any steps we can take to reduce the chance of this virus or any other viruses in the future spreading, like changing our eating habits or reducing the negative impact on the planet? And you know, I warned the people long before, easily 15 years ago, in the same way, and I know that uh, Bibi is very much interested on that question, you know, in the same way that you are moving into areas where the humankind didn't go before, like in the middle of the jungle, like for example, in the Brazilian Amazon jungle, you know, or in the, how will I say, Asian or African jungle, 
you will be more and more and more and more exposed to microbes where that or that human beings were not exposed before. And if we were exposed, we were in, in, in very small groups, tribal groups that move into that area where the mortality rate was high, but the contamination rate was low because they were very few and very far from the other tribes. So for that reason, you know, I think that what we are doing, um, how will I say, introducing ourselves, moving ourselves into areas that are very much reserved. And in this case, I know that we will be very happy to hear that for the, how will I say, environmentalist people, yeah. you know, we will be more and more exposed to those microbes that are natural or their natural, uh, how will I say, reservoirs, mice, bats, you know, and uh, the other ones. And I guess open. as we as we also move into more ecosystems and more ecosystem destruction, Absolutely those viruses correct. are going to become more prevalent. Absolutely correct. And the only way to prevent that is biovaccines. Because so, you don't know what you're going to face. You know, back again, the trick in this case, it is to, first of all, what happened, you know, we learn a lot of lessons from this pandemic. One of them, it is that nowadays, thanks, the people has not appreciated that, you know, that, you know, nowadays we can identify the causing agent in two weeks. Two weeks, could you imagine, Gerardo? You know, before it used to take years, oh, yeah. years to identify the agent. And how will I say, at the beginning of this century, it was not years, it was practically decades. Nowadays, it's two weeks. We can identify the requirement. And once we know not only the characteristic of the agent, but also the genome, you can immediately introduce, how do I say, to convert that information into diagnostics. And with the methodology I suggested you, into vaccines. You know, that can be done. And it has to be done. You know, as soon as new agents appear, you know, I know because as I told you before, my mentor Ronald McKenzie and I, we were working, we identified a hell of a lot of viruses here in Colombia. Because since he was looking for new viruses, how we found it was a hell of a lot of new ones. Lucky that they were not pathogenic for humans so far, you know. But you know, the velocity to identify new agents nowadays is outstanding. And the people have to express the cognition and gratitude to science in that way. Nowadays we are moving in that area extremely fast and obviously you can do the diagnostics and for that and besides that you can do also the development of the vaccines the way you want but that I, can be done quickly i just have a quick follow-up question on that so why why are these viruses becoming more uh i guess pathogenic for humans now why are they transferring we from are, we are a different host a different host, completely different host, while their natural host, the reservoir, uh, the pangolins, the bats, uh, have the host, how do I say, cell host molecules that can be, that they were used to do that. While in our case, you know, they find new receptors, new receptors. But let me warn the people also that listen to you and to attend to this presentation. Not everybody has those molecules. You know, so for that reason, it is impossible, absolutely impossible, that any virus can kill and wipe out humanity in one single movement. No, that's going to be very difficult. First of all, because there are genetic control of the expression of those receptors molecules. And second, because there is also a genetic control of our immune response, so that there are people who respond very quickly, probably those ones that do not suffer any, how will I say, big symptoms, those ones that like 81% of the total population that are infected by this virus, the coronavirus, you know, 81% of the people, you know, 
have mild symptoms, probably because they didn't have the appropriate receptors, or they had a fantastic HLA system for them to attack the virus and destroy it at the pure beginning. They are very high responders, and it was shown and demonstrated later on by a good friend of mine who died, who got the Nobel Prize in medicine. His name Baruch Benazer Raf, who was an excellent friend of Henry Kunkel, my master. They were the ones who found that there are people who are very high responders, not some of the people who are very low responders. It is not for a very simple disease, you know? You can be now a high responder to the coronavirus, but probably a low responder in malaria. Did I make my point clear? So that that is the thing. Yes, yes that is. I what happens when you're so silent? <laughs> I have a question about that because at this point, there are people that think, you know, because 80% or 81% of the people are not affected, that it's not a big deal, that it's not a problem, and that we should all go out and just live normal lives. And to me, um, we, I want to find out from a scientific point of view, if isolating, if locking up uh, co countries is, is important to do at this point. So far, yes, Tati. So far, yes. Remember that the, what it had to be done at the beginning, it was, how would I say, to put in quarantine the sick, the ill, the diagnosis. And in quarantine, the first ring of contacts. And in quarantine, the second ring of contacts. That it will have been the solution so far if when someone develops the appropriate vaccine. But, but if there are so many people that are asymptomatic and spreading it, shouldn't we could not be, go out as much? Could be, could be. Remember the way it was found very recently. You know, I have to say, that the people that they in the United States are excellent people at the NIH, you know, and um, at the other institute that is directed by Tony Fauci, you know, I met him long before when I was at Rockefeller University, you know, and you know, he is in that sense right in the sense that, you know, we have to, uh, let's say, to lock ourselves for some time until now. For example, in the United States, what they have found it is that the virus can go in the little drops of saliva up to three meters. And that if you look at the boots or the, how I say, the dresses of the doctors who are working with them, they are definitely contaminated by the virus. So that you, we have to be very careful, very careful. I want to do a follow up on that because it actually it's a question from from one of our listeners. Um, you know, obviously isolation you've mentioned is very important, but now that we're looking into the next step, Roger from the U.S. asked this question: What is your recommendations for a responsible exit strategy to the lockdowns and the shelter at home directives that some governments have given around the world? You know. You were very kind when you said at the beginning that I am an expert in infectious diseases. That's all, the, that's all what I have done in my life. Since I am 19, now I am 73. So I am one of the members of the have very high risk mm -hmm. now. Right. But, uh, you know, what happens is that the infectious diseases have a dynamic. You know? They start very slowly, as we saw in China, in the other countries. And then suddenly there is a huge explosion what it is what we call exponential development, and then they reach a plateau, and that plateau can be for several weeks more, and then it starts descending slowly. So don't be so confident thinking that if you are, uh, let's say, released from the hospital, you are not, as I say, spitting the virus. Transmitting the virus. You may have it, probably not in the nose, but you may have it right now. For example, it is known very recently that as well as BH1, this virus is reproduces inside the lymphocytes. So if you make a diagnosis here with a SWAT and it is not present in there, 
then make sure that you that the virus is not present in other organs of your body. So that we have to be very careful with this. Yes, go ahead, go ahead, baby. I was going to ask, so what, what do you think, how long do you think it would be, or can we expect for a vaccine, an effective vaccine to, to be developed? Uh -huh. To develop a vaccine is not really, let me put it this way, it does not take so long. But there are so many regulations, many, many, many. Remember that I was the one who started by 1987. That's imagine how long, you know, 33 years ago with human trials. I was the first one. And I was very careful, you know, doing things that only by ethical and logical reasons. We had to avoid. But then, then later on, the different authorities established more and more and more and more and more rules. And uh, nowadays, we are, how do I say, caught in our own rules. You know? So for that reason, I would say that to develop a vaccine in the experimental models cannot take more than three months. But imagine how many steps do you have to surpass and to go above that, you know, in order to do the human trials, you know, yeah. that is going to be the limiting factor, you know? Right. So. But it's necessary because we've also heard the other side that vaccines, there's been, for example, some people say, or studies have shown that in India, some vaccines have supposedly killed little girls or harm them in any way so our vaccine that's, comple that's completely true daddy but uh let's think on, a, on an alternative one on a possibility like for example they say that uh there are some vaccines that induce convulsions let's say the the papilloma one you know until when you solve that problem usually takes three, four more years to end up that it was, how will I say, sometimes a hysterical, I am not saying that that's the answer, you know, uh, that the people suggested that it was a hysterical reason or that the main problem with biological vaccines, it is that they can come with contaminants. The contaminants that are produced during the growth of the protein or the growth of the microbe in biological systems, which are very difficult to remove. With chemically synthesized vaccines, you don't see that. Because if you say this must have 2,354 atoms, if the vaccine has 2,359 atoms, you have to change the batch. In biological systems, it is impossible to detect that. And sometimes you are exposed to batches that are very good and some other ones that are not that good. So that, those rules are excellent for biological vaccines. But for chemically synthesized ones, does not make any sense. Got it, got it. What's next for, for you? What's next for Dr. Manuel Elkin Paterroyo? What would you like to achieve or share uh, to live in this planet? I hope that my luck expectancy reaches the 90 years, for 95 years. I will be working night and day, 365 days. And when I reach the 85 years of age, we will be in 12 years, I will ask for a week of vacations. <laughs> Good. That's great. Sounds That's perfect. perfect. I would like very much to express my gratitude. Questions were excellent, not very good, excellent, you know? And uh, my gratitude and recognition to all your efforts, your work, and to poor Tatiana, that you <laughs> did, that you, Bibi, and you didn't allow her to talk. You know? okay. <laughs> I did have, I did have a question. Do, do, do it, do, do it now. Let's do it. So, uh, the purpose of this question is to inspire entrepreneurs and all of us going through challenging times. Are there any lessons learned or any challenges that you have had to overcome? Let me, let me tell you a little story, you know. 
my mother was a very, very, I would say, strong personality. You know, my father was a very philosophically oriented person, very much. You know, he was a real thinker. You know, and my mother used to tell our uh, her children, we are eleven children at home, never give up, never give up, and that it is my advice. You know, sooner or later, if you persist, you will find the answer, but never give up. And if you fall down, wake up faster than you are falling down. I said, mother, but that it is against gravity. And then she said, well, break it. <laughs> she replied, break it, right. which is something that I have learned, you know. For the malaria vaccine, people think that this was, or they, well, thought at the beginning, that this was going to be an easy task. I had it clear from my mind that it was to find the rules to develop vaccines, which it is with what we are following in here. Any vaccine, any, any, because these are mathematical rules. What we have already synthesized 48,000 molecules. Could you imagine that, Tati? You know, molecules, large molecules that, you know, some of them are easy to synthesize. Some of the ones are very difficult. And we have tested 4,500 of them in monkeys. Wow. What you have to do is the vaccination, not only the vaccination, but if you want to know if they work, you have to go ahead and expose the animal to the parasite and read a little drop of blood every day during 20 days, every, and count 10 to 15,000 cells per drop per day per monkey. Oh Could my. you imagine how many? That's a lot of work. No wonder you get up at three in the morning. <laughs> billions, <laughs> billions. So that, that is never give up. And the second suggestion by my parents was be generous, be solidarious, be generous, solidarious. The people will help you. You may have detractors, but don't worry about them. That's natural. Being very Catholic as we are, you know, my father said, is Jesus Christ among the 13 disciples that he had? He had one who denied mm -hmm. another one who betrayed him. Why do you wait to have a lower percentage? <laughs> so that, that is, that's so true. don't worry, it's natural. Yeah? Okay, that's wow. my suggestion. Never give up and be solidarious and, solid and, and, and generous. That's so Before you go, we just want to say we're so grateful as Colombians, as global citizens and as entrepreneurs, Thank you for making this world a better place and thank you for being with us here today. We really appreciate it. What an honor. Thank, thank you. you very much. You are a great, you are a great example of what it can be done. Okay? Good. Thank you, thank you. And un beso para Maria Cristina. I will tell her that. Okay? Good. Thank you. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye. Bye. Hey, before you go, we want to thank you, our awesome audience, for being part of the show. And if you found this episode of value, please share it with your friends and loved ones so they too can be part of Mindful Entrepreneurs Thriving.